this morning we continue with our series. Normally someone would introduce the speaker. I'm the speaker and the host uh, today, so I can introduce myself. Pete is very good looking, <laughs> well-mannered, extremely humble, and, uh, and he's speaking to us this morning, and that's me. So here I am. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and we continue with our series this morning. Uh, we've been looking at this issue of radical community, and we've been looking from the um, book of 1 Peter, the letter of 1 Peter. So there are Bibles around in the chairs if you want to grab one. Um, some of the verses will come up on the screen as well if you just prefer to look at the screen. And uh, as we go into this, we're going to explore what it looks like to be a holy priesthood. Now, I don't know who you think you are or uh, whether you've ever dreamed of being anybody. I, I had a kind of mild obsession with being a certain person when I was younger. I used to always think and, and long for and dream about the day when I would be James Bond. It was all about that for me. Any time I could get a tuxedo on, there it would be. I'd kind of do the bow tie and I'd sort of look. I'd learn to raise one eyebrow like James Bond. Uh, James Bond. I'd choose, you know, vodka martini shake and not stirred, even though I had no idea what that was because I was only 12. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I'd kind of just try and be James Bond everywhere I could. I'd watch the films and study it. I had every video. Anyone remember videos? Yeah, some of you. Some of you are like, what's a video? A video is like they're kind of cumbersome big things. And you can press play and fast forward and stop and pause and the whole screen goes like that. It's really good. So I had every video of James Bond. I just wanted to be James Bond. And then that song came out. I just want to be James Bond. And I love that song because that's basically how I spent many of my teenage years. There was one bank holiday weekend where... Um, I managed to convince and kind of probably force a whole group of my friends to make our own James Bond movie. And uh, obviously, I cast myself as James Bond. So I was James Bond. I cast a girl called Heather as the, as the Bond girl, knowing that there would be a screen kiss. So, uh, and, and there was. Uh, it wasn't very Bond-like. It was very awkward and looked like two teenagers knowing nothing about what they were doing. So, so I just, I love James Bond. I lived in this stuff. And I remember, actually, when, I, um, when my faith came alive and I chose to follow Jesus, uh, when I was about 14, um, faith came alive. I made a commitment to follow Jesus. I wanted to live for him. And I remember having a very serious prayer time with God. And in that prayer time, I, um, I bought this stuff before God. And I said, Lord, you know that I want to be James Bond. But when I look at James Bond, I don't think he matches what a Christian would be like. Because he kind of kills people and he does all sorts of other things that perhaps Christians wouldn't necessarily need. And I remember having this really serious conversation with God, like, God, if I am a Christian, I follow you, can I still be James Bond if they offer me the part? And I grappled with this for weeks, honestly. This was a like, serious concern because I so thought that I would be James Bond. Now, I don't know who you think you are. Not James Bond, maybe. The Amish money penny. <laughs> but you know, who you think you are will hugely influence who you become. Who you think you are will hugely influence who you become. So who are you, really? Our passage this morning is like a grand display of Peter saying, you're this, you're that, and he's speaking stuff over us here right now. This, this letter is recorded at a time when there was persecution and rumors of persecution, and, and the author is writing to people following Jesus, saying, this is who you are, realize who you are. And one of the resounding things that he says twice in the passage we're about to read is that you are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. I don't know what you think about that. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you a holy priest? Now, some of you look really awkward. Some of you look really awkward. And you're, and you're thinking, am I? Is that what I am? Am I a holy priest? I don't feel like a holy priest this morning. I just got out of bed and had a cup of tea. Maybe Pete wants us all to get dog collars on and wear those kind of funny things that all the vicars wear. So what is it to be a holy priest? Let's read the passage, and then we're going to explore it together this morning. So... Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, if you're reading in the Bibles. It's maybe worth having it there throughout the talk, but it's on the screen for now. 
Therefore, so it's coming from something before. And if you've missed the last two um, uh, sermons in our series, then you can catch up online. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord Jesus is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So here it is. You're a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a people belonging to God. Now, I don't know if you feel like that, but I hope that after the next few minutes, as we look at that passage, all of us today may leave this building may walk away from this talk and confidently walk into our week knowing that we are holy priests. And for some of us, that may feel like, okay, I could go for that. Some of us, it's like, that's so far off. So let's have a look at it. First of all, we need to ask, what is a priest? What on earth is this letter talking about when it talks about priests? What's it got in mind? So what's a priest? And then let's learn a few lessons from this passage that will help us to become holy priests. So what's a priest? What was going on in the mind of this letter, this letter of Peter to Christians? What's a priest? Well, we can't ignore the Old Testament when we're looking at this New Testament letter. And actually that passage is soaked in quotations from the Old Testament. It's all over it. The cross-referencing goes on forever. It's almost as if the, the author has sat there and kind of looked at what the Old Testament says and then written this so that we can understand it now. So as we look at the Old Testament, the word priests and, and priests are talked about over 700 times. It's a, it's a big deal in the Old Testament. And priests in the Old Testament, in, in the times before Jesus, were mediators between God and his people. And the priests would work in between God and his people and be mediators. They would help people to access God and to know who he was. They would deal with the sacrifices they would work in the temple. They would, they would deal with the worship and help the worship to flow. So priests were in charge of helping people bring a sacrifice to God and give their lives to him. They were in charge of helping them to worship. Priests had authority to bring spiritual knowledge to people, to teach people about God. And so they would work leading people to God and they would be the ones who had access to the very presence of God and the people would come to the priests to be shown who God was, what he was like, and to make their, their, their lives acceptable to God. They were intercessors, mediators. Now, if at the end of this service, you know, I thought, oh, I've got nowhere to go for lunch. Uh, what shall I do? 
I, I know, I'll wander up. I'm going to pop down just, just along the road to Buckingham Palace. That'll do. That'll be lovely. They, I'm sure they do a lovely spread every lunchtime at Buckingham Palace. So I'm going to go along. I'm going to knock on the door and, you know, say, you know, we'll just wait for someone to answer. The Queen will come to the door and she'll go, hey, hello, Pete, welcome again. And, uh, you know, I'll wander in and, and in I'll go and I'll sit down at the table. I'm, you know, morning in majesty. I've just had a busy morning at HTB again. I'm just a few hours of rest before the afternoon service. Is that okay? Yes, fine, absolutely, Pete. You know, and then she kind of serves up a cup of tea and I sit rack and shares long and kind of lie out and stroke the corgis and then you know we have a conversation I did alpha once I loved it you know whatever it is and off we go and I thought I'd lead a group next time whatever it is you know so have this lovely conversation with the queen and, and all of you are thinking of course this is not going to happen don't be stupid Pete I can't just walk down there waltz in to the monarch the, the queen of our of our nation and just kind of knock on the door and have a cup of tea I can't do that because I'd be met by those guys with the huge hats, you know, who walk around with red stuff, you know, huge hats. And, uh, and, and, and there are other people on the door who'd stop me going in, and, and, and it's their job to mediate who meets the queen. And so I can't just pop in for a cup of tea this afternoon if I just fancy it. If I wanted to go and meet the queen, I would have to, you know, go, you know, write a letter and say, um, you know, I'd like some downtime between services, can I come? Or something like that, and maybe, maybe they'd, they would let, the, let me in, I doubt it, and you're all thinking I'm mad, of course. If I was James Bond, of course, I would be able to go. Um, so maybe I should keep that going, but I can't just walk in there. Now, God is slightly different to the queen, you, you may realize. Um, he's even more powerful, and he is king of the universe, but... He wants his people to come to him. So much as many of the staff of the queen are there to sort of stop various people getting to the queen and working out who can and can't, God wanted his priests to be set apart, to be holy, so that they could help the people meet with him and know who he was. That was the role of a priest. And now it seems that in this letter... The author is inviting us to become priests. He wants you to become priests too, to be people who will mediate, who will introduce people to God, who will be set apart and holy, who will help people learn what sacrifice means, giving their lives to God, who will help people to worship God and enter his fullness and his presence. God is longing for us as a church to be this holy priesthood, who are those that are bringing everyone to know who God is, acting and operating like that. And so there would be a resounding cry from this letter that would say, who are you? You are a holy priesthood set apart by God to bring the world to know him. So what can we learn about what priests are like so that we could become more priestly, that we could become that holy priesthood. Well, here's the first thing. Priests operate through Jesus. Holy priests, if that's going to be you and I, if we're going to step into what God longs for us, to be this mediator, to, to bring many to know him, to herald his kingdom and be part of that, be close to him, be bringing many in, if, if we're going to enter into that, then we must understand that priests operate through Christ. Look at verse 5 with me again of our passage. It says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We could skip over that through Jesus Christ, but it's really important. Because, you know, we can only be holy priests because of Jesus. Because Jesus himself first has become the great high priest. In Hebrews 4, it calls Jesus the great high priest. He's the one who's gone ahead. Jesus has blazed the way and he said, this is what it looks like to, to come to know God. Let me show you with my life. Let me show you with the sacrifice of my life. I will become the sacrifice that allows you to enter into the very presence of God. Through my life being laid down, if you come to me, you can know the very presence of God. You can be washed clean. All the things that have ever been wrong in your life can be made right because I have paid the price on the cross. I have been the sacrifice. 
My sacrifice is the loudest language of love to this world. And so through his sacrifice, he demonstrates God's love made clear for all of us. So that if we go through Jesus, we can know God. And so Hebrews chapter 4 calls Jesus the great high priest because Jesus has gone ahead into heaven for us and on behalf of us and right now intercedes on our behalf. He's mediating, wanting all people to come to know God. And he's speaking to the Father at the right hand of the Father, speaking about you and me, bringing us in, and as we trust in him, we are included in him because he is the first, the great high priest, and he invites us to become priests too so that we can approach God with confidence because he's gone there first and made a way for us. I can't be a priest if I don't recognize that Jesus is the great high priest. I can't operate as a holy priest unless I ask Jesus to wash me clean, to renew me. I can't be a priest unless I'm in Jesus. And so our passage goes on to describe what Jesus is like. And it says that he's like the cornerstone. Now, I don't know if there are any builders here amongst us. Any builders are with us? Some of you, no, I can't see a single builder with us. They're obviously not in church. They're building houses today. So if you're a builder, you know about cornerstones. Now, I don't, I'm no builder. I know very little about this. But obviously, I've read this passage. And I'm like, what's the cornerstone? We sing that song, you know, cornerstone. And we, off we go. What are we talking about? Well, the best I can get to, the closest in terms of my building abilities, which are poor, is there's a photo going to come up. And uh, I built this. This is the only house I've ever built. It's a little Wendy house for my children. So if you want to come and play, you can come anytime. The door's quite small. You probably won't fit through. Uh, but it's, it's fun. I, I, I just thought, I'm going to go for this. I just have a go at this project. Now it's, it's held together with you know, glue and, and nails and all sorts of stuff in a kind of terrible way. If you look closely, it's poorly built. It looks nice because I painted it, but it looks really bad. But one thing I learned when I built that is that you see the corner there. This is a piece of offcut from that corner. And in, inside that corner, this piece of wood, the rest of this piece of wood that's been sawed off, sits. It's the corner piece. And I realized very quickly when I was trying to put this thing together and I had no idea how to do it, that I would need something strong in the corner. And this corner piece gives it strength so that, that a piece of wood can go this side and can go this side and the corner makes it strong so it can stand. And it's still standing with little toddlers throwing things against it and pushing it around because the corner is strong. So the cornerstone is where the strength is. The cornerstone is where it sets the direction. This corner here sets the direction, which means that that little house is at direct right angles. So it stands well. It's not all floppy and all over the place. It's a strong structure because the corner has set the direction on both sides. The cornerstone gives the strength. The cornerstone sets the direction. If it wasn't for the corner, the thing would fall down. If it wasn't for Jesus, the whole thing falls down. And so as priests, we need to be priests who recognize a holy priesthood who operate through Christ. Secondly then, secondly, priests operate through Christ and priests thrive in community. Priests thrive in community. Now I don't know, some of you that may fill you with dread. <gasps> community? Because this is a death blow to the rampant individualism in our culture. Our culture just screams, doesn't it? It just screams, you, you, you. All our adverts are just kind of trying to speak to us individually. Everything about a lot of the things that are set up, it's about me, my rights. How can I survive? Is it good enough for me? I will choose whether I go there or not. It's getting stronger and stronger as the generations are emerging that we are polarizing to be totally individual. And yet scripture, time and time again, comes against that and says it's not about you as individuals, it's about community. It's about being together. Do you notice the words that are used in this passage? A holy priesthood. That's a community, that's many priests. It's not, oh, he's made you a holy priest. It's a holy priesthood, a chosen people. It's about a community. A holy nation, it's about a community screaming again and again. It's about being in community, being knitted together. together. So much so that we must believe 
That if that's true, we thrive when we're absolutely, deeply, and utterly immersed, immersed in community. We are made for one another and to be alongside one another. It's about community. And so this passage begins to explore that by talking about living stones. It talks about not just stones like rocks that build a house, but but actually living stones, people, people being put together. Now I'm going to grab a couple of uh, unwilling volunteers. Michael Rosemary, can you come back? Sorry, come on up. Um, Let's have Michael Rosemary up. Let's give them a round of applause. And um, James and Lisa, James and Lisa, when you come up, that'd be great. James and Lisa, come up as well. So this is James and Lisa, who are part of our congregation. Can you stand up on the top there? Just on that bit? I know you didn't agree, but there we go. Sorry. They agreed, but they didn't. Okay, come on up. This is James and Lisa. Now, James and Lisa, they've just started a connect group, which is one of the smaller groups in our church to help people connect with community. Come and stand next to these guys. And the picture that's being built in this passage is not of just rocks being put together, you know, just like some dead stone, but a living thing, living people being put together. So if you could all stand so there's no cracks between you, like you're cemented together, like these bricks. And, and when we learn to operate and live together, we thrive in this. Why? Well, because there's James and Lisa, they lead a connect group, and they've got a heart to, to work with a smaller group of people and help them connect to the church, and, and that's the gift they're bringing. And they're bringing other gifts in their, in their workplaces and their families, and, and that's good. But then, then there's Michael here, who's, who's learning about worship, involved in Worship Central Academy, and, he, and he's learning to worship, and he wants to help lead God's people in sung worship. So he's got that gift. Now, I don't know if James is very good at sung worship. Do you, is that something you do? No, not so much. But isn't it great that he's connected to Michael, who can help him with that? And isn't it great that Michael's connected to James, who can help him with the pastoral care and what's going on? And then there's Rosemary, who's passionate about this connecting and the host teams, as we heard before. And she's brilliant at drawing people in. And you watch her, she's just talking away to people and helping people feel at home. And that's a gift she brings. Because you see, we all carry different gifts. We all bring something different to the body. And if we chose to be individual and outside of it, away from the community, the community loses out. And you lose out. You lose out because you're not connected to people who bring something different. And the community misses out because you've got something to bring. And we as a community all want to stand together, being built together as living stones, building this kingdom of God in our very midst. Thank you very much, guys. Off you go. (laughs) Got that round of applause. Now, when you're actually building something and you've got two bricks, these two stones are kind of, you know, not ideal for putting next to each other. They're kind of all odd shapes. Now, of course, when I try and put those together, they're going to bash against each other. Look, all the mess and everything. They'll bash against each other. Sometimes I've got to actually take bits off like this so that I can fit it better together. I might have to be tipped away, and that's a bit like our character. It's a bit like what goes on for us, that as we engage with community, God shapes us up. The people around us shape us up, and we become more like God because we see it in others. We get challenged and sometimes it hurts. And sometimes we engage with community and that is not so comfortable, but it's because God is shaping us up so that we fit together and we, we together are building this incredible house of God. Priests thrive in community. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine everybody involved in our church here at HTB, all serving and thriving alongside one another, learning from one another, serving, making things happen. And as we all get involved, so the kingdom is built. In the Old Testament, it was much more about the bricks. They were much more interested in, well, not necessarily more interested, but it was about the presence of God being in the temple. The temple was important, and people would go to the temple to encounter and meet with God. Now, people come to us, to the people of God. Now, people come to see it in us. We are being built together. We are that temple. We are the living stones built on that cornerstone that brings us strength and direction. So much so that we are the holy priesthood. So priests operate through Christ. Priests operate through Christ. Priests thrive in community. And finally, priests rid and crave which is a challenge to us this morning. What do I mean? Well, look again with me at verse one, and I read that to you. 
It says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. And so it's, it's like, get rid of these things. Now, do you notice all of those things are characteristics? It's like the characteristics that need to be bashed off us, that need to be sharpened. And, and if, it, if we're about individualism and about ourselves, envy can thrive. Why? Because if, it, if my life is about what I get, then I get envious of what they get. If it's all about myself, then I might slander other people because I don't value them the same way. The reason I slander someone is because, because I don't recognize that they are connected to me and our relationship matters because we're part of the people of God. But if I decide that I will be away from them, then it's easier to slander. And so this list is a list of characteristics that undercut our ability to be priests. And so it says rid ourselves of that. That Greek word for rid literally means strip it off. Take it off, strip off all of those things. Now, I, I used to be a youth minister, and um, I, I kind of you know, worked with this youth group, and every year I'd go to this festival called Soul Survivor, and I uh, loved Soul Survivor, it's absolutely fantastic, um, apart from the years when it rains. You've seen these pictures, haven't you, of festivals where it rains, and one year our, 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 our group were all camping at the bottom of this hill, and so when it rained, all the water came down and all gathered around our tents and the mud just grew and grew and grew as the week went on. Honestly, we were finding straw and, and, and cardboard and everything, trying to make little roads around our tents because the whole thing was just squelching. We lived in boots covered in mud. And one of the days, uh, the youth group, because you know, they obviously liked me so much, decided to totally trash me. And they threw me in the mud and, and kind of this whole kind of bundle ensued where I was utterly caked in all this mud. And to make it even worse, it's an agricultural showground. And so deep in the mud are years of trodden in, yeah. So, so it was just, just, I was covered head to toe in this stuff. It was, it was all over me. And I remember peeling off my clothes so dirty and utterly ruined, so much so that I had to throw them away. That's how bad it was. And that's what Peter's getting at here. It's like, don't let that bad stuff stay on you. Rid yourself. Peel it off. It doesn't look good. It doesn't smell great. Take it off and get rid of it. Rid yourself of it. Totally free from it. Don't go back to it. Now, I don't know about you, but this is not like a one-off thing. Like I didn't do this 10 years ago. I will rid myself of malice and envy and hypocrisy. I'll rid myself. And now I'm done. I'm totally fine. I'm, I'll have none of those things. It's almost like a daily thing for me. I catch myself with envy and it's like, okay, rid myself of that envy. Rid myself of that. Rid myself of that hypocrisy. I now spot it. I will rid myself of it. And it's like a decision that, that holy priests make to keep ridding themselves. But then what do they do? We don't just rid ourselves. We then crave pure spiritual milk, it says. Carry on into verse 2. Let me just read that to you. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted the Lord is good. Hunger for that. Now, I've been near the world of craving recently because um, pregnant women crave, don't they? And uh, we've had a few children in the last few years and the cravings come and, you know, if, you, if you've ever um, had a baby, you may well have had cravings yourself. I don't know that because I've never had a baby personally. But I know that my wife has not. I looked up some of the crazy cravings online and, you know, some pregnant women, they crave pizza with vanilla yogurt on top. Like, what's that all about? Um, other, other people, all sorts of odd cravings that go on. Some people crave smells. So they crave the smell of a sponge. That's probably, that's a, like a regular one. I don't know if there's one here who's, who's craved for the smell of a sponge or the smell of petrol. So presumably there are pregnant women walking around with bowls of petrol, sniffing away and I don't know how that does for the baby, but it's not ideal. But like these cravings hit pregnant women and all they can do is, is they want more. My wife, Sarah, when, when she's been pregnant, she wants yellow food. B bizarre, it's like anything yellow. So it's like yellow crisps or cheese or, or toast with yellow stuff on it. Anything yellow, get it in me. And there's like, you know, a pregnant woman, you just kind of see them like, oh, 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 I just got to crave this yellow stuff, whatever it is. You know, poor husbands who are out at two o'clock in the morning driving around trying to find McDonald's to get the chocolate milkshake because she's desperate for a chocolate milkshake and she'll kill for it. You know, that's the craving. 
Lots of um, mums are smiling to themselves. They know what this is like. It's the same thing here. Crave pure, good, spiritual milk. Rid yourself of that stuff and crave. I, I can't stop until I get it. I've got to get some of that. I want the pure spiritual milk. I want the word of God. I want the community of God because I'm going to learn and grow there. I want to crave after I long for the gifts that he's got for me. I want to fulfill the life he has for me. Step into the potential that he has made for me to fulfill. I'm craving him. And that's as much a choice as it is an emotion. You don't have to wait until you feel like that craving come on you, like a pregnant woman. You can make that choice even today. I can choose. I'm going to rid myself of that. And I'm going to choose to crave this. And as I choose that, I believe that craving will become more and more. As you step in, it grows. And then, as we do that, we arrive at our final verse. Verse 12, where Peter calls us to live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they might see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You see, the best advert for Jesus is the holy priesthood. Who's the holy priesthood? That's you. And people, the world is watching. Some of them are accusing and going, this is a waste of time, this is a load of rubbish. How can you believe in a God who's like that? What's going on? And we can come up with a million answers, but the biggest and strongest answer is to be the holy priesthood so that they may see our good deeds and glorify God in heaven. That they might watch us walking in the light away from the darkness and so be captivated by our mediation with God that they're able to say, I want that. I want that. And so the resounding cry from Peter this morning is, will we be a holy priesthood? Priests who operate through Christ. Priests who thrive in community. And priests who will rid and will crave. And if we really get that, if we really hold that in our hearts, if we choose that, if we go after that, then our every day will change. Your work day tomorrow will be different because now you're a holy priest. Your family will be different because now... You're a holy priest. You know who you are and you're able to operate in that. Who you believe you are will influence who you become. Who you believe you are will influence who you become. And you are a chosen people. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy priesthood. Step in. Welcome to the holy priesthood.